Welcome to the fifth part of the Ancient Roman Iceberg. If you haven't seen the previous parts, I would definitely recommend you go check those out, as they cover some things that we are going to get deeper into in this episode. Anyway, let's get into the video. We start then on the sixth tier of the Roman Iceberg, and this tier is mostly dedicated to some, shall we say, interesting theories, along with some aspects of Rome's founding. This tier is represented by Julian the Apostate, who is quite possibly my favorite Roman emperor. First up, the Aeneid. The Aeneid is an epic poem by Virgil. The poem tells the legendary story of Aeneas and the eventual founding of the city of Rome. The poem is made up of 12 different books. The first six start with Aeneas' journey to Italy following the Trojan War, and the last six deal with his and his group's wars in Italy. I can't get too deep into the story of the Aeneid, as we would literally be here all day, but here are the quick cliff notes. Book one starts off with Aeneas, who is an actual character in the Iliad, who has just fled the downfall of Troy. Aeneas is the subject of a prophecy foretelling that he will journey to Italy, where he will give rise to a quote, noble and courageous race, that will be known to the whole world. Aeneas sets off from Troy, following the Greek coast to Sicily, and then eventually Carthage. Book 2 and 3 are mostly a retelling of the story of the Trojan War, which Aeneas is relaying to Dido, the queen of Carthage. It is essentially the story of Troy that we're all familiar with, just with the added bonus of the slain prince Hector and the goddess Venus, Aeneas's mother, appearing to Aeneas and telling him to flee the city before it can fall. Book 3 finishes with the tales of Aeneas's journey to Carthage. They initially build a city on Crete, but are forced to leave it following a plague. They find a harpy who tells them to continue to Italy. They encounter Andromache, the widow of Hector, and Helenus, one of Prim's sons, and both tell Aeneas of his ultimate destiny, and finally they journey through the land of the Cyclopses. Yeah, real fun times. Book 4 picks up back in Carthage. Queen Dido has fallen in love with Aeneas, and attempts to get him to marry her. At first, Aeneas is very receptive to her love, and it seems like the two will marry. However, Aeneas is reminded of his duty by the god Mercury. This leaves Aeneas with no choice, and he and his companions leave in the dead of night. Dido is thrown into grief, and she commits suicide but declares that her people will forever be set against Aeneas and his people, predicting the Punic Wars. Book 5 details Aeneas' time in Sicily. Here the men participate in a variety of games as well as military parades, two things that would eventually become central to Roman identity. Towards the end of the book, he is told to journey to the underworld to receive a vision of his and his people's future. Book 6 chronicles that journey in the underworld. Here he meets Cerberus and the Shade of Dido, who remains irreconcilable. Finally, he is brought to the fields of Elysium, where he is shown a vision of the destiny of Rome. He sees the greatest men of Rome, men like Romulus, Marcus Camillus, and the Caesars. Book 7 starts with the Trojans settling in Latium. He marries the daughter of a Latin king, Latinaeus. The daughter, whose name was Lavinia, was supposed to marry a king of the Rituli, Turnus. Turnus, in his anger, declares war upon Aeneas and his men. The war carries over to Book 8 where Aeneas is now seeking help from the various tribes around Latium. He first turns to the Tuscans, who are enemies of Turnus. This journey brings him to the future site of Rome, where he meets King Evander of Arcadia, a region in the Peloponnese. Evander's son even joins Aeneas. Aeneas is given weapons by Vulcan after his mother, Venus, begs Vulcan to arm Aeneas and his men. Book 9 starts with an attack by Turnus on the Trojan camp. He is repelled and forced to jump into the Tiber. Book 10 has Aeneas return to the camp with his new allies and a battle ensues, which Aeneas wins. Book 11 really only deals with the funeral of Pallas, the son of King Evander. And finally, Book 12 deals with Aeneas' final victory over Turnus. Aeneas and Turnus fight in single combat, and Aeneas finally kills him. And really, that's it. After that, Aeneas starts a line of kings that would eventually culminate in Romulus, and then the story of Rome as we know it plays out. Now, I'm sure we can realize that a lot of this is obviously not true, like Aeneas' journey into the underworld, the encounter with a king of the Peloponnese at the future site of Rome, and of course the intervention of various gods throughout the story. I haven't seen many claims that those things are true, but what I do see a lot of people claim to be true is the flight of some of Troy's survivors to Rome, or at least to Latium. Frankly, there's no evidence for this. Firstly, we know for a fact that the Aeneid was primarily written, as I discussed in the last episode, as a form of propaganda. Its goal was to increase Roman pride in their state. This would naturally increase social cohesion, 
which was at an all-time low, what with the constant state of civil war and all that, and that social cohesion would lead to a more stable state. Or at least that was the hope. Secondly, we have no evidence of anything like this in either the archaeological record or in Greek writings. Rome and the surrounding area are one of, if not the most excavated sites in the world. The careers of some of the best archaeologists and historians the world has to offer have been dedicated to Rome, and there has never been anything even remotely suggesting a large influx of Greek refugees at any point in Rome's history. We should have found something if it existed, be it letters, other writings, new building techniques, new religious artifacts. I mean, just think about how different the cultures of Latium and the cultures of Troy would have been. It's impossible to have a merging of those cultures without both leaving some sort of imprint on the historical record. Okay, look, the point is that we have never found any solid evidence of Trojans coming to Italy, despite the fact that the area they were supposed to have colonized being the most studied area in the entire world. But to play devil's advocate just a little bit, is it possible for the Trojans to have made it to Italy? Sure. Is it likely? Well, no. The Aeneid is a legend and a myth. It was written to legitimize Roman rule over the Mediterranean, to give Rome a link to the great history of the Greeks, to emphasize good Roman characteristics, and to bring the Roman populace of the time closer together to hopefully prevent another series of terrible civil wars. It's not history, and frankly, it never will be history. The truth is that Rome developed out of the local Italian population, the Latins, and likely with a little bit of help, or possibly domination, from the Etruscans, a people to their immediate north. It was not a sudden influx of Trojan heroes that pushed Rome to become a great city. It was the result of thousands of years of habitation and the gradual, but steady, crawl towards city-state status. We're doing this a little bit out of order, but it fits pretty well here, so I'm going to go ahead and cover it. The founding of Rome has been a hotly debated topic for a very long time. The Romans themselves claim their city was founded by Romulus. The exact date is a little bit up for debate, but most of the time 753 BCE is generally accepted as the most common. But 800, 750, 720, among others, were also recorded by various Roman authors. Today, with the advantage of archaeology and access to far more historical records than contemporary Romans, we know that Rome, or at least the hills that would make up Rome, had been inhabited for much longer. We know for a fact that Rome was occupied by the middle of the Bronze Age, circa 1700 BCE, and we suspect that it was at least partially inhabited even before that. This evidence mostly comes from pottery shards and a few burial structures. The Capitoline was probably the first to be inhabited, in about 1700 BCE. The Palatine was probably next, around 1350 or so. By 900, we are fairly positive that all the hills of Rome had at least some sort of habitation. Terraces have been discovered on both the Palatine and the Capitoline that indicate the local population were likely Latin farmers, who slowly spread to the other hills in the area. It was around the 8th century BCE that activity in Rome began to really pick up. At this point, the largest settlement was probably on the Palatine, but the Capitoline and the Coronial Hills both held a decently sized population as well. It was around this time that the Forum began to develop. Burials in the area were stopped, and portions of it were paved over. We see the first evidence of a wall in about 730 or 720 on the Palatine. It seems that at this point, the city of Rome had developed a true boundary. There were gates and streets, and overall we see an increasing level of centralization, something you would expect with a developing city-state. By 600 BCE, Rome was almost certainly united. The clans that had occupied the hills in earlier centuries were now all intermingling, and the development of the Forum as a central meeting area, along with designated civic structures, points towards a system of government. So we can certainly say that by 600 BCE, Rome had been founded. Is it possible that the city had become what we would call Rome before that? Sure. The truth of the founding of Rome is that it's complicated. It was not a sudden process. It was a long, drawn-out process over multiple centuries. Because of that, you could say that Rome was founded in 1700 BCE with the first evidence of habitation on its hills. Or, you could say it wasn't until about 600 BCE, when all the hills seemed to have united into one political entity, that Rome was truly founded. Frankly, we will likely never know for sure when Rome became Rome instead of just a loose collection of villages. But it did happen, and 
we will likely have to be content with just knowing that. The Legio 9 Hispania, or more commonly known as the 9th Spanish Legion, was a legion in the Roman army that has been lost to history. It's become something of a cultural icon, with novels, movies, and endless theories about what may have happened to the legion. But first I should give you a quick overview of the known history of the legion, as it may help us try to figure out what exactly happened to bring about the disappearance of an entire legion. The legion likely got its start in 90 BCE, during the Social War, but it's most famous for being assigned to Julius Caesar when he became governor of Cisalpine Gaul. When he became governor, he inherited the lead of four legions, the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th. It seems that the legion was at first ordered to remain in Aquelia, a town on the border of Cisalpine Gaul, to guard against a possible invasion by the Illyrians. But we know the legion served under Caesar during his famous Gaelic Wars. The legion continued to support Caesar during his civil wars, and following his victory, the legion was disbanded, and the veterans were settled in Italy, specifically around the city of Picenum. Those veterans would be recalled by Octavian, Caesar's adopted son, during the war with the boat king Sextus Pompeius. The legion would then be sent to Macedonia before fighting with Octavian at the Battle of Actium against Mark Antony. Their nickname, Hispania, would be gained following Octavian's rise to sole ruler of Rome. They would be sent to Hispania, otherwise known as Spain, to campaign against local tribes and to garrison the area. This seems like a good time to mention that tracking individual legions is something that is difficult to do at the best of times. Firstly, before Augustus standardized the legion's numbering system, there were multiple legions who were named with a single number. Because of this, the early actions of legions are sometimes mixed up with other legions that held the same number. We are also missing some of the documents that would tell us where legions were sent during the imperial period. and. Sometimes legions were simply ordered to move with no real record of the order being recorded. This especially happened when it was the emperor himself who ordered the legion to move. So we are mostly guessing where the legion went following their time in Hispania. It's likely they were ordered to the Rhine, an area that needed far more legions than Spain did at the time. They were probably relocated after the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest in 9 AD and sent to the province of Pannonia, modern day western Hungary. At this point, the 9th falls off the radar until 43 AD, when they appear in Britain as a provincial garrison. They likely served during the invasion of the area under Claudius. At this point, the 9th became a leading legion in Britain. They fought against various native tribes, and even fought the famous Iceni under Boudicca. It was during the war with Boudicca that the legion suffered their first serious defeat in Britain. They lost most, if not all, of their foot soldiers attempting to relieve a siege at modern-day Colchester. Only the cavalry managed to escape. This took the legion out of commission for a time, but eventually they were reinforced with men from Germania. We know that the 9th participated in the invasion of Caledonia, or Scotland, in 82-83 to 83 AD, and that they reconstructed a legionary fortress in York in 108 AD, but after that they seemed to disappear from the historical record. Modern archaeology has found some evidence of further activity of the legion in the Netherlands. Several tile stamps and some jewelry have all been found containing some sort of inscription mentioning the 9th Spanish legion. Further, a shrine to Apollo was found near Aachen in Germany that was said to be erected by Lucius Latinus Macer, who described himself as the chief centurion and prefect of the camp of the 9th Spanish legion. So, it seems as though the legion left Britain following their activities at York and journeyed to the Rhine, where they were seemingly based between 104 to about 120. So what happened after that? Well, we know that by 197, the legion seemingly no longer existed. We know this because of a column inscribed with the list of the legions from 197, along with a list provided by Dio Cassius. The two lists are identical, and list the same 33 legions, with no sign of the 9th Spanish legion, or even anything near it. So we can assume that whatever happened to the legion happened between our archaeological evidence in or around 120 and the compiling of the lists in 197. The traditional theory, before the archaeological findings, was that the legion was wiped out in the north of Britain sometime around 108. This is of course seemingly disproven with the archaeological evidence. Those findings indicate that the legion was not only still intact, but seemingly fairly successful as the officers who had inscriptions at the area in the Netherlands went on to have fairly successful public careers, something that obviously would have been impossible if they had been in charge of or died with an annihilated legion. 
This has led to the development of two main theories to explain the loss. The first has to do with the Second Jewish Revolt in 132, well within our time frame. We know that in the early stages of the war, Rome suffered heavy casualties. It would make sense then that the legions would be summoned from across the empire to deal with the rebellion. Perhaps the Ninth was one of those legions called in. To complicate this though, another legion, the Legio 22 Diotarania, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, or Diotarius's 22nd legion, is generally agreed upon as suffering such heavy losses during this rebellion that it was either completely destroyed or simply disbanded. If we assume that both were lost during this war, then that would mean it was the worst Roman military disaster since the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, which lost three legions. If that is true, then we would expect there to be some sort of historical record with the event. After all, the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest was engraved into Roman society. Its impact was so large in the Roman character that it would be remembered for generations, and every Roman historian who was worth their salt recorded the legion numbers of the lost legions. 17, 18, and 19, by the way. The other theory is that during Marcus Aurelius's war in Parthia, from 161 to 166, the legion was ordered to take part. Cassius Dio accounts that a Parthian army surrounded and completely annihilated a Roman legion in Armenia during this war. This defeat was enough to cause the governor of Cappadocia to commit suicide, as the legion was supposed to be under his command. The two legions that were supposed to be attached to Cappadocia at the time were the Thunderbolt 12th Legion and Apollo's 15th Legion. Both of these legions were operational and used in war well beyond the war in Parthia, so it couldn't have been either of those legions that were destroyed. So the theory is that the 9th was transferred to the command of Cappadocia for the duration of the war and was destroyed during that ambush. Again, the issue here is that there is no record of such a transfer, nor have we found anything in the archaeological record. And yet still, other scholars still believe the Legion met its ultimate destruction in Britain. This mostly relies on the fact that no record of the Legions in the East has ever been found, and that the dating of the archaeological finds could be incorrect. So, in the end, we again have no idea what really happened to the Ninth Legion. We know that they were there in 108, and likely in 120, but by 197 they were gone. We likely will never know what exactly happened to them. But personally, I would probably put my stock in the Parthian theory. The archaeological findings in the Netherlands seems to prove that the army left Britain. I don't think the Jewish theory could be accurate, as losing two whole legions would have left a serious impact on Roman history and would have been something that would be well attested to. But we will probably never know for sure. The Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, or as it is less often known, the Varian Disaster, is one of Rome's most humiliating defeats. In fact, you could probably say this is the most influential defeat the Romans ever faced, and it marks the transformation of the empire from a successful expanding state to a more introspective state focused on its own survival. Before we can talk about the battle itself, we should first set the scene just a little bit. Rome had been dealing with the various Germanic tribes since Caesar had pushed the Roman border to the Rhine during his famous Gallic Wars. The border proved to be one of the most active in the world, with various incursions by both sides happening basically every year, and most of the time multiple times a year. Our story really starts with a Roman named Varus. Varus was a very successful Roman, despite his family having fallen on hard times when he was born. Varus was a very strong supporter of Octavian, the future Emperor Augustus, he served alongside him during his campaigns in the east, and even seemed to have gained the attention of Octavian himself. When Agrippa died in 12 BCE, it was Varus, along with the future emperor Tiberius, who delivered the eulogy. This was a position of supreme honor. Agrippa had been the closest friend of Augustus. The two were essentially brothers, and for Augustus to allow Varus to give his eulogy was a great honor. This boosted his career, and just a year later, he was elected consul once again alongside the future Emperor Tiberius. For a few years, Varus is shifted around the empire governing various provinces, including Africa, Syria, and Judea. He even put down the Jewish revolt in the area in 4 BCE. While all this was going on, Tiberius had been waging several military campaigns in Germania, with the aim of conquering the region and pacifying the local tribes. By the year 6 AD, all of Germany up to the river Elbe was seemingly occupied, and now, Rome needed to exert control over the region. In the year 7, Varus was appointed as the unofficial governor of the region, and was told to ensure it was added to the Roman fold. This appointment really made a lot of sense, as Varus was an experienced military and administrative man. 
he also had dealt with local rebellions, and so seemingly had some experience in controlling an unruly local population. Varus was given command of three legions. These were the 17th, 18th, and 19th. While encamped for the summer at Vetera, modern-day Xanthan, Varus received reports of a large revolt of various Germanic tribes in the west of the province. The man who came with this warning was Arminius, almost certainly not his name by the way, way too Latin. Arminius was a German noble who had been born to a chieftain allied with Rome. Because of this, he was raised in a manner similar to that of Roman nobility. He learned Latin, was well versed in the classics, and even joined the Roman military. He was educated in all Roman military theory over the course of about five years, and even managed to earn Roman citizenship and the equestrian rank. No small feat. However, some of the other German nobles in Varus's retinue didn't quite trust Arminius. We don't know for sure why, but we do know that several nobles warned Varus not to trust him. Varus, though, ignored their advice, and marched at once to put down the rebellion. The army marched at daybreak, and all seemed to be going well. Arminius was with the army for the first few days, but at some point he told Varus that he would be leaving with most of his forces to move ahead and finish mustering Rome's German allies. With hindsight, we know this was suspicious, but at the time it really wasn't. Arminius was seemingly committed to the Roman cause, and his status, being the son of a local chieftain, meant that he was the go-between for the Roman army and the local auxiliaries. So, Varus let the man go. Arminius left behind only a few of his men. These men were supposedly guides, but in reality they served as spies. You see, Arminius had already betrayed Varus. There was indeed a rebellion, but it was a rebellion spearheaded by Arminius. On September 8th, in the year 9, the Roman army was marching through a thick forest. This forced the army to do two things. Firstly, they were marching at a snail's pace, and secondly, they were strung out into a long, thin line. In fact, from the head of the army to the tail end of the force, the distance was likely over 10 miles long. Perfect ambush territory. Early in the morning, the Germans struck. This first assault was actually pretty light and was mainly just an attempt to tire the Romans out and pull the few remaining rebellious Germans out of the Roman army. The engagement was brief, but it accomplished its goals. Following this, we are told that a downpour swamped the area. The army was now essentially stationary. The wagons carrying the supplies, already having a tough time in the dense forest, were now essentially immobile. Varus ordered the army to make camp. Here, Varus met with his commanders, and received reports on the earlier ambush. Casualties were light, but the baggage trains and the scout cavalry, two extremely important aspects of the Roman legion, were both hit the hardest. Varus and his generals decided a night march was needed to attempt to get out of the danger zone. They were sitting ducks, and they knew it. This proved to be a mistake, as Arminius had anticipated the move and set up another ambush just a little bit further ahead. The Germans made excellent use of the terrain, and chose a spot whereby the Romans only had a few hundred feet on either side to march in. To add to this, the road had been blocked, and a massive earthen wall had been constructed along one side of the road. The Germans attacked as soon as the Romans were within eyesight. The Romans attempted to storm the wall, but failed. Pneumonius Valla, the highest ranking officer after Varus, attempted to retreat, but died in the process, and at that point, Roman defeat was essentially sealed. The Romans panicked, and the Germans charged from all sides. Many of the Roman commanders, including Varus, committed suicide rather than face capture, while thousands of legionnaires died. All three legions were completely destroyed, and the Germans did not stop there. With the main Roman forces in the region destroyed, they swept across this new imperial province, destroying Roman forts and garrisons all across the area. It was only due to a bit of luck, along with the arrival of Tiberius with reinforcements, that the Germans were unable to cross the Rhine. The Romans would have their revenge just a few years later when Germanicus Julius Caesar, the son of Drusus, led a successful retaliatory campaign destroying Arminius and his armies. However, the damage had been done. The impact of this battle is still a hotly debated topic among historians, but it did seem to seriously temper Roman ambitions to conquer Germania. In fact, it seemed to temper Roman ambitions to conquer most everything. After this battle, the Roman spirit of conquest died down heavily, the Rhine was reinforced, and it would serve as the border between Rome and the Germanic tribes for centuries to follow. While the Romans did lead several campaigns into the region in the centuries following the battle, None were as extensive nor as committed to conquering as the campaign by Tiberius. 
Some historians will simply say that Rome had reached its zenith in terms of ability to control territory, and that it was simply that realization that stopped the conquering. And to be fair, they certainly have a point. But the defeat at the Teutoburg Forest should not be underestimated as a strong factor in urging Roman restraint when it came to conquering Germania. Losing three legions was a humiliation for Rome, something really only matched by the Battle of Cumae centuries earlier, and it would leave a mark on the Roman spirit for the rest of the empire. Conspiracy theories are sometimes great. I really do believe that. Sure, the ones about pedophiles controlling everything, or every election that doesn't go your way being stolen, are stains on our society that shouldn't be seriously entertained. But conspiracy theories also have a way of pulling people into something that they may have not even considered looking into. I'm not talking about the crazy 45 year old southern man who believes that aliens or the democrats are going to harvest his brain. I can say that as a southern man who has actually heard someone say that before. I'm talking about the person who sees some outrageous claim and decides to actually do their own research into the topic. where they frankly normally find that outrageous claim is batshit insane. This next entry is exactly my point. I first saw this on Twitter, and no I won't call it X, where all good conspiracy theories start. I'll see if I can find the original tweet I saw and flash it up here, but essentially it was this woman claiming that the Roman Empire was not real, and Rome actually left no mark on history. At first I just laughed and went on about my day, but I eventually saw another tweet on the topic, this time with a link to a TikTok. From there I discovered that there are actually people, or at least seemingly people, who genuinely claim that Rome did not exist. Some claim that it just didn't exist, and that all the monuments, archaeological evidence, and so on was simply one large psyop. For what purpose, I'm not really sure. Another one claimed that the Spanish Inquisition invented Rome to unify Roman Catholics and or give legitimacy to the church. My favorite of that person's points was, why did Rome not write in Roman, why did they write in Latin? Which is, frankly just is hilarious. There's also some theories about Roman architecture being Greek, and something about the alphabet, blah 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 blah. To be honest, it's so extremely stupid that it's actually funny. And let me be the first to say that Rome was real. I don't quite know how the city of Rome could exist if the Roman Empire didn't, but anyway. Also, if the Empire didn't exist, did the Republic, or the Kingdom for that matter? Where did the Colosseum come from? What about the Roman Forum? And what about the fact that historians outside of the Roman Empire recorded it as existing? And further, what is the site of Pompeii? I can really go on and on. But I do want to take a moment here to genuinely be serious. It is dangerous for our society for someone to try and warp a view of ancient history in this way. While we can joke and laugh at the obviously crazy person online, this sort of lying and manipulation is a problem. These people talk with such authority that it's easy for someone to be like, well, okay, maybe they are actually onto something. And that's dangerous. It is dangerous for people who are not educated to speak on things that they have, frankly, no qualification to speak on. It's the type of intellectual dishonesty that can lead to more serious consequences. While I doubt any violence will spawn from some random person on TikTok claiming that Rome didn't exist, this type of conspiracy theory can serve as a gateway into much more serious and much more dangerous conspiracies. Or this theory could easily spiral out of control and become that much more dangerous conspiracy. After all, if they, I guess meaning the government or whatever all-powerful, all-knowing organization is continuing to claim that the Roman Empire existed, can make up something so influential on society, then that naturally leads to a question of, well, what else is fake? What other aspects of culture, society, and government are simply constructs made to advance some secret agenda? It's that type of thinking that leads to the more dangerous territory. I'll leave a link to a great video on this subject by a great YouTuber, the Lady of the Library, down in the description. She is much more articulate than myself, and she does a great job of really ripping apart many of the claims by this TikToker, or whatever you call them. Damn, I'm getting old. So I want to leave this section off with this. Do not believe everything you hear on the internet. It's so incredibly easy to simply pick up a phone, record some stupid conspiracy theory, and gain a following on TikTok, YouTube, or any other social media app. You should never take one person's word as gospel. Not even your resident idiot. Look at other sources. Pick up a book. Look in other corners of the internet. Just do something to find other viewpoints and to find other evidence. 
The internet is one of, if not the greatest invention in the history of humankind. It has increased the overall level of human knowledge in a way that nothing else ever has. You have the sum of human knowledge at your fingertips. Don't waste that opportunity on crazy people on TikTok. Now to my favorite, and apparently fake if we are to believe that last entry, Roman Emperor. Julian the Apostate, Flavius Claudius Julianus, more famously known as Julian the Apostate due to his rejection of the Christian religion, was born in Constantinople. He was the half-nephew of Constantine the Great. Julian was probably raised as a Christian. He very nearly met his end at a young age, when his cousin, Constantius II, led a massacre of most of the living male descendants of Constantine. He did this to secure his power, and by the end of the massacre, only Constantius, his brothers Constantine II and Constance, Julian and Julian's half-brother Constantius Gallus were left standing. Julian and his half-brother were probably only spared because they were simply too young to be a threat. Julian was around six years old, and Constantius was about eleven. Both were kept under strict guard, and mostly kept from public view after the massacre. Julian would be raised in Asia Minor in a sort of semi-exile. He was educated by various bishops, and seems to have truly been a Christian. It was only when he turned 20 that he began to embrace the old Roman religion. We don't really have much sourcing for this time in his life, but whatever happened, he himself states that, quote, he had spent 20 years in the way of Christianity and 12 in the true way, meaning traditional Roman religion. In 354, Julian was recalled to the court of Constantius II, the last remaining emperor. Constantine II had died in 340. Constance in 350, and Constantius Gallus had been executed in 354, after very briefly ruling as Caesar of the East. Constantius's court was in Mediolanum, modern-day Milan, and for two years Julian was kept under watch to ensure that he was loyal and not going to rebel against Constantius. Julian would be cleared, and in 354 Constantius appointed him Caesar of the West, and he was even married to Constantius's sister, Helena. It seems as though Constantius really wanted Julian to be more of a figurehead rather than an actual Caesar, but unluckily for Constantius, Julian embraced his new role. Julian then led several campaigns against the Germans before being hailed as Augustus in Paris in 360. This was mostly due to the fact that Constantius had ordered many of Julian's troops to leave Gaul and join him in the east. This was likely an attempt to stem Julian's growing influence. Julian's actions in the next few years are a little strange. At times, he seems to be in true revolt, and even uses the title of Augustus, while at others he seems to be doing what he was doing before this whole mess, and mostly just fighting various native peoples that threatened Rome's security. Whatever the case, by June of 361, Julian was well and truly in revolt, and the two sides seemed to have been gearing up for a final confrontation somewhere in Illyricum. This would only be avoided when Constantius died in November of 361. At this point, Julian was the last remaining male heir to Constantius, and his claim was now unopposed. He entered Constantinople in 361 and was crowned as sole emperor. Julian wished to return to the days of Hadrian and Marcus Aurelius, and so did not attempt to set up any sort of government resembling the Triarchy. But he also didn't want to rule as an absolute monarch. He even went so far as to say that the ideal ruler was a primus inter pares, or first among equals. You can see him hearkening back to the days of Augustus with this title. Julian even debated laws and policies in the Senate of Constantinople, and even sat among the Senate during these sessions. Julian also believed the empire needed to be decentralized. He gave more powers to cities by returning the control of city land to local authorities, instituting new city councils who held civic authority, and made tribute given to the state voluntary. Yet, Julian did retain some authority, and most new laws, taxes, and related items had to be personally cleared by him to take effect. Julian's ideal Roman government was odd for the time, to say the least. He really believed that it should be individual cities and towns that make the civic decisions across the empire. The imperial government should really only be focused on enforcing laws and defending the empire from external threats. I, I guess you could call him kind of like a proto-federalist? He also started on a path towards reintroducing traditional Roman religion. He required school teachers to be approved by him. This allowed him to influence what was being taught in Roman schools. He also reopened many of the pagan temples in the empire, 
as well as restored much of the property taken from those temples. Many of the privileges that had been granted to Christians by the previous emperors were rescinded, including the stipends given to some bishops and churches from the state coffers. But Julian was unable to fully complete his reforms, as his attention was needed elsewhere. His position was still a little shaky. While he could rely on the Western Army, after all they had been supporting him against Constantius, the Eastern Army was a bit of an unknown. Julian determined he needed to lead the Eastern Army on a campaign against the Sassanids to try and woo them, so to speak. The goal was to secure a quick victory, and use the glory, prestige, and most importantly new wealth from the victory to secure the loyalty of the Eastern Army. With that done, there couldn't really be any serious challenges to his rule. This didn't happen. The invasion was a disaster, and the Romans were in full retreat basically from the moment of engagement. Julian would be seriously wounded by a spear during one such confrontation, and this wound would eventually cause his death only a few days later. Julian never really got much of an opportunity to leave behind a legacy. In fact, if it wasn't for the simple fact that he was public about his conversion to Roman paganism, he probably wouldn't be remembered for all that much. But for me, Julian represents a turning point in Rome's history. I see him as a sort of last hurrah for traditional Roman religion and culture. After him, the empire becomes much more Christianized, and while Rome was still Rome, it was different. If he had only succeeded in Persia, who knows what would have happened. Perhaps we would have seen a resurgence in traditional Roman religion, or perhaps the empire would have been torn apart by a series of new civil wars, but this time, instead of competition for political power, it would be for the cultural and religious character of the empire. We will never know, but I truly believe that Julian is one of the empire's greatest what-ifs. And that is where we will pause our examination for today. We are almost finished with this iceberg, and hopefully we are getting to some things that you haven't really heard about or don't know that much about. I hope I've introduced you to something new that you find interesting. Join me next time as we continue to dig deeper into the depths of Roman history. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something. Definitely let me know if any of these topics in particular has struck your fancy, and I may add it to the list to cover more in depth. I apologize that this video is again only one tier, but I really can't help myself when it comes to writing beasts, and they end up being way too long to do multiple tiers. The next two episodes, though, will be two tiers long, so hopefully you can all look forward to that. Also, apologies for this being two days late. I'm an idiot who is not very good at time management. If you have any comments or questions on the video or believe I've made a mistake, please comment down below and please like and subscribe if you enjoyed. It really helps the channel out. Peace.